let's get right into it. So today we got uh, Jonathan Whitaker. We were talking on uh, Facebook a little bit, and you were telling me some of the uh, the cool things that you're into. You build cars. You've been on. You've had cars on that Dude and Blues channel. Um, you got a bunch of different projects going, and then you work in power in Florida. So you help supply Florida with power. Is that the right way to describe yeah, it? Or the power generation industry. Okay. So uh, I know a couple of episodes ago, you guys had an electrician, right? Yep. So he's on the opposite end of the spectrum. He's uh, he's on the consumer side. He's downstream. Exactly. I'm on the complete opposite end. So yeah. he's power delivery or power consumption, energy consumption, really. There's mm-hmm. a difference between power and energy, which we can talk about, but I'm on power generation side, so where the where the power is actually produced. Okay, that's super interesting because right now I feel like more than ever, car guys are arguing about power grids. Oh, 100%. like it's it's this weird argument that all of a sudden all of us car guys, all of us that love cars, are now fighting about power grids, electric cars, things that we don't really know anything about. Yep. and we're arguing about them on the internet. Rightfully so. I, so. I would hope that I can leave this with some knowledge that if there's a comment thread of some uneducated people, maybe they can leave with some education. Yeah. So the whole thing is like our power grid is going to collapse if there's a million electric cars added or whatever. Yeah, the, the power grid that is currently in the United States now, the infrastructure more or less hasn't really changed in the past 40 or 50 years. Mm-hmm. And the energy consumption has grown at a rate that far exceeds what the grid was initially designed for. So, like, as power plants have been built, sure, there's been substations, there's been uh, transmission lines that have been added, but all the other existing infrastructure that's in place has not really changed. So, much like when nuclear power plants were built, and these guys, when they built them, they never expected them to be around even currently to this day. Mm -hmm. I think the same goes for the grid. Uh, It should have been upgraded. And I think that they're working tirelessly to upgrade it, but that is, that is the next most important step as a, as the U S country, right. Yeah. In terms of energy and power production is the grid. In fact, like some people, uh, I read a lot of articles and blogs and, I watch a lot of documentaries pertaining to this. Uh, it kind of fascinates me. But some people have gone so much and so far as to say that it should almost be declared like a national emergency to bring it up to a current standard um, because the U.S. energy consumption, I think when I last read, was like over 4,000 terawatts annually. That's like an unconceivable number. It is. Like, to somebody like a, me, that's completely like... Yeah, and I, I honestly don't like... I typically talk in megawatts and kilowatts. Um, you know, a kilowatts, a thousand watts, a megawatt is a million watts. A yeah. terawatt, I, I honestly talk in terabytes. I know exactly. That. I know that so concept. It's going to be so. the same <laughs> yeah. decimal move yep. for watts or power, right? I think so. most of us can kind of comprehend that with the tera and the giga. That's exactly. kind of become common common language in the world in yeah, the last ten true. years, which Di- is kind of funny. Digital age. <laughs> yeah. So. Oh man, that's so tough. I've I've seen some documentaries on this too about how fragile it is and mm-hmm. how s- super f- succumb to terrorism all of them are. Basically yep. unguarded stations that if things happen they take, you know, 10 like 10 months to even get a transformer from overseas, like stuff like that where yep. I mean, I'm sure you've seen all that where it's like Wait, it takes this long to get this part? Yeah, there's, you know, obviously COVID um, and, and companies are still, you know, I, I personally hate the excuse, you know, just trying to buy car parts, right? Like, oh, you know, supply chain issues, right? The go-to. Uh, yeah. Unfortunately, though, it is a realistic, you know, uh, issue that faces many manufacturers and OEM companies uh, in terms of power production, right? There are parts that need are needed for operation and maintenance of power plants that are they have lead times. They already had long lead times pre-COVID. Now post-COVID, they're they're pushed out like eighteen months, two years. So these these planned outages that some of these power plants have, they're forced to find creative ways around certain things. Like, hey, this unit really isn't running optimally, mm-hmm. but we also can't get these parts. <laughs> so, 
So you have like engineers trying to band aid things to exactly. kind of make them work. Well, that's yeah. I guess that's a good time to have a car guy in there because yeah, that's kind of what we normally do. Is there there are some very talented individuals in the industry, and I've met I've met some incredibly talented machinists, electricians. Mm -hmm. uh, and they call the there's certain there's a certain uh, role called INC, which is instrumentation and control. Um, these guys are you know they make me look absolutely terrible on my best day. So. <laughs> Um, and typically a lot of these plants, like they'll have a machine shop right there, right? Yeah. So you can, you can, you, can, you know, there's lathes, there's bridge ports, you can do whatever you want. So like at a station, like mm -hmm. a, I guess not a substation, what would you call it? A main station? Uh, well, the power plants are just called plants. The plants. And, yeah, yeah. I don't know if that was like a, yeah, yeah that was, that was a dumb point on my point, but on <laughs> my part, not, not, uh, calling them the right thing, but, uh, yeah, so they would have all that stuff. That's completely something foreign to me. I didn't think that they, they would do have, have a like lot of stuff on site, um, like Haas machines and stuff like that, where they can like five axis make stuff. Now they do not. Now I will say they don't have a, you know, they don't have like a five axis CNC machine or anything like mm -hmm. that. They're, you know, they're, they're also budget limited mm -hmm. like any other company. They're not going to want to spend that much money on something. Uh, most likely though, you know, they're not afraid to, to contract something out though. Like if they need something like, Hey, you know, I would say in general, uh, utilities and power plant owners, they don't like losing money, right? So if they have to spend money to prevent losing money, they're going to do it. Um, That's true. Yeah, so, they definitely love charging me. That's one thing that I <laughs> noticed about them. And I will say, like, what you're getting charged really as a consumer is not what the power plant is selling their electricity for. So the, the economics behind it, um, and not a lot of people know this, but Power plants will sell their electricity wholesale, and you're buying it at retail through a different party. Um, so they they sell their electricity in megawatt hours versus you paying for electricity in kilowatt hours. I pay in kilowatt hours. They sell it in megawatt hours. So so it's a completely different yeah. scale, right? Like they're they're selling it in bulk, right? You know, at, they can't. They don't just sell direct to consumer. Yeah. So Let, like by me, it's Peace River. Exactly. And they're not actually making the power. They're buying it from yep. someone else. Now, in certain instances, some utilities could both produce and sell the power. Um, but there are regulations in place. Um, like Florida, for example, has a captive rate payer, right? The energy industry is, is regulated in Florida. So you, they can't just hike your rate up for no reason, right? But but they can't. what they can do is they can raise your rates based on you know, the rising fuel costs or anything like that. Yeah. And this is, this is nationwide. Um, but, and, and I kind of want to circle back to something you said yeah. not too long ago about the in, industry being like susceptible to, let's say like terrorist attacks, right? Like when they took down that pipeline, natural gas pipeline, um, that affects a lot of natural gas combined cycle power plants, which is a lot of people don't realize in Florida is 74.8% of our power is natural gas is natural gas. And that doesn't come from Florida. It's no, that pipelined in or well, is pipelined it, into Florida. Okay. Yeah. So it's not like it's like a natural resource of Florida. No, but it's pipelined. It's in. pipeline. But there's in, pipe, yeah. the pipeline subterranean structure throughout the United States is very intricate. Yeah. A lot of it's from Canada, I believe. Right. A I do believe the they were gas. working on a pipeline and I don't know if that's one of the first things that was shut down in like the Biden administration yeah. or something like that. But I know it was, there's a huge uproar and, uh, but yeah, like if you look at, if you look at energy mixture by fuel source, um, you can go to, statisto.com and you can type in anything right you can type in energy mixture fuel source florida you know oklahoma texas california you can type by country france united mm -hmm. states that fuel mixture for florida right is 75 percent natural gas whether it be from a combined cycle power plant um which i can explain in a little bit what that is or a, or a peaker uh, gas style power plant which is uh the difference is a combined cycle power plant will reuse exhaust heat to superheat water into steam and then use that steam to spin a steam turbine. And a simple cycle gas turbine power plant just doesn't have that. It's just gas turbine by itself. Like so gas turbine, a simple cycle gas turbine is like on average 27 to 35% efficient. Whereas a combined cycle power plant, a modern one, can be as efficient as to 65%. Oh, wow. So 65% of the 
you know, chemical energy that's going in is being converted into electricity. Yeah, that's huge. I mean, that's double. Yeah, and a lot of people, you know, I, I am very passionate about uh, people that don't speak to what they know in terms of renewable energies, like mainly like, you know, activists and tree huggers. Now, I don't, I don't want to preface it with saying I'm not a renewable energy hater. I'm just a hater of ignorance. Yeah. So when someone says, like, all of our problems can be fixed by solar and wind. Ah. Yeah, I think. Um, Talk about that for. Days. I would love to hear about that because the renewable thing is a huge problem. My hometown up in New York, I talked about it a little bit, is dealing with um, wind turbines being put off sea, offshore. Mm-hmm. And they're, they hardly produce any power. They affect all the wildlife. And they look terrible. Yep. And 10 years ago when I lived there. It was a nuclear power plant that was protested until it couldn't open. Yep. And now it's just crazy to see like what could have been our freedom. What was the name of that power plant? Because I'm 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 pretty sure it was in Connecticut. It was offshore Connecticut area, but it the was nuclear plant. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. Yeah, there was one I watched. Uh, it wasn't Three Mile Island. <laughs> no, but I, I do remember hearing about one where. It was pro. Te- it actually did open and commission, but then it shut down within like a month. I believe that was that one because everybody was so scared of it. There was so much doom and gloom. Yeah. It was so new, and nobody was giving correct information. I feel like it's even me as a kid. I was, you know, this was ten years ago, probably fifteen years ago. I was twelve years old. I was terrified because mm-hmm. I was like, oh man, like, like yeah. my whole the what they told us the propaganda as students was, it's. Close enough to where it would kill us in a nuclear issue, mm-hmm. but it's not close enough where we would really benefit from the power. Yeah, and I mean, there's there's a lot of uh, reason to be scared, right? I mean, nuclear energy is the only energy in the world that can have the negative effects that it can, right? I mean, you look at Chernobyl, you look at Three Mile Island, you look at Fukushima. Um, all of those have very similar outcomes in terms of you know fallout, radiation, Um, I would recommend anyone, you as well, if you haven't seen it already, there's a documentary called Pandora's Promise. And it's a documentary talking about nuclear power told by, told by once anti-nuclear activists turned pro-nuclear. So these are told by climate activists. These are told by, um, uh, for lack of a better word, like tree huggers, right? Yeah. Um, and these these people are the very people I, I kind of mentioned before, right, where they're like, no, you know, we we have, you know, thousands of terajoules of energy from the sun. We can power the world. And like that's theoretically, yes, you're not wrong. Yeah. But in application, we lack the technology to be able to do that properly. Um, but anyway, this this documentary is, is fantastic. And it lays out um, exactly you know what you're talking about, the fears that people and, and you know, some of the biggest propaganda Folks for anti-nuclear were actually oil and gas companies. They Makes would, sense. and they and still to this day, without people really knowing, um, they are some of the biggest promoters and campaign drivers for renewable energies. And I know that may sound surprising, but the supplemental fuel source for solar panels and wind energy is natural gas power plants. So, for example, there's a huge wind farm in Nebraska. Actually, one of the largest wind farms. I think Warren Buffett owns one of them. I think I've driven through it. Yeah, the, the largest wind farm in the country is in Indiana. And it's, I mean, I drove through it uh, earlier this year. And it's, I didn't know at the time it was the largest until I had been driven, driving for like 10 miles. And I'm like, oh my God, there's still wind Yeah, trains. there's still more. So, you know, you look it up and it spans, I'm going to get the numbers wrong here, but, you know, there's Roughly, yeah. hundreds of thousands of square acres, right? Mm-hmm. Um and it's producing, it's producing the same or less megawatts than a nuclear power plant. On tens of thousands of on acres. A much larger footprint. Yeah. Now, I will say for wind turbines, I do agree like that a lot of those wind turbines were put on farms. So if a lot of that land is already being used for something anyway. Yeah, they don't take up a huge footprint on a farm. Exactly. Now, I will say there's also studies of like how underground cables and electricity affect crops and stuff like yep. that. I, I can't speak to any of that. I, I know that. If there's a study about it, I'm sure there's some sort of effect, you know, both either positive or negative, probably negative. Um, but my point is, the reason I started this conversation is the 
on a day the wind blows the hardest and those wind those wind turbines are producing you know maximum output natural gas power plants run more than they do when they don't so they run more when they're producing maximum output when wind turbines are producing maximum yeah output. and so i know that sounds crazy when they're in peak efficiency natural gas is actually still using more not at the same time but the reason is so if there is a thing called a uh, power generation curve, right, and it's it depicts how power plants are dispatched into the grid, mm -hmm. it's typically dictated by fuel cost. So when all renewable energies have zero fuel cost. I mean, it's free: wind, solar, hydro. Yeah. So they're dispatched first, followed closely by nuclear. They're next in line, followed by combined cycle power plants, um, natural gas, mm -hmm. followed by coal. And now that used to be backwards 10 years ago, but because of the rapid decrease in price for natural gas, as well as regulations against coal, they've kind of switched on that dispatch curve. And then after that is peaker gas power plants, which are the most expensive to run. Those are typically simple cycle gas turbines um, or mature frame uh, combined cycles. So they're not as efficient, but those are the most expensive to run. When you have a large wind turbine farm producing, I don't know, 700 megawatts of electricity, let's say, and the wind suddenly stops blowing, you've just lost 700 megawatts of capacity on the grid. Yeah. And you need to make that up like that instantly, cause... instantly. So there are people, uh, they're called grid operators or they're, they're called many different things, but behind the scenes right now, as we speak, you know, these lights being on, these people are making moves and calls so that folks at home never see a change in electricity output. So there will be a massive drop in electricity and then they'll have to call up these power plants. Hey, I need you to turn on like now. So you have dispatchable power, at the flip of a switch. That is the mm -hmm. biggest difference between renewable energies and every other type of power plant is that you can turn it on and you can make power when you need it. So they still need, in theory, like a home generator like you'd get for a storm that can turn on in a second when you lose power from your exactly from your wind turbines or solar or whatever it is. So like those, I've, I've heard this, are the least efficient and they use the most amount of fuel mm -hmm. because they have to be quick. Mm -hmm. Whereas the other gener the other forms of power take a couple hours or days yep. to whatever fire up and start making. Yeah, like for example, uh, typically America's even globally the nuclear fleet is going to be a baseload fleet. You can't just turn a nuclear power plant on and start producing power. Can't just flip it on like yeah. a generator. They're massive <laughs> steam turbines. Um, the, the the nuclear reactor right is just a, a heat source. It's creating steam to to spin steam turbines and you can't start like spinning and turning and burning on a steam turbine right off the bat because there's things like thermal growth. You have to get everything to grow at a very similar and linear rate or else things start to interfere with one another. Right. So it's a very gradual process as you ramp up mm -hmm. into, into full speed, full load. Um, but that's the problem with wind or one of the problems with wind. The other problem with wind is typically, the maximum wind production, this is a double-edged sword. One of the other problems with wind is the maximum wind production is typically at night. Now, I'm going to like bore you to death with charts because there's the, yeah. like, the information is like m abundant. The power demand curve is a chart that depicts power demand based on time of day. Yeah. Now, when would you think like the least demand for energy is? The least demand I would probably think is about midnight. Yeah. So, and most demand I would probably think is like five, four p.m. Actually, you're very, very close. So, like right when people get off work, that's when internet. Yeah. I'm just basing off of when internet use yep. is best versus worst. Like at five p.m., six p.m. around this neighborhood, mm -hmm. I know it slows down. So you're exactly right. Like the the least demand for energy is between let's say eight thirty nine p.m. and four in the morning. That's like everyone's asleep. Typically, yeah. you know, you maybe have your AC running, but you know, doors well, aren't opening. It cools it's down cooler at night. Out. Exactly right. Yeah, you know, and now, right, that's starting to slightly change with 
electric vehicles. So the demand is going up. So like, oh yeah, yeah. I can see wind turbines the night. starting to at least make a difference in that front. But that is one of the one of the problems with wind turbines. Is like they're making their maximum production when energy is at its lowest demand. Mm -hmm. The other problem is the most wind production of the country is in the wind belt, which is in the central plains. Nobody lives there, so so you have all this energy production yeah. for a very desolate area of the country. Now, a lot of people have come to realize, well, let's just take the energy from there and put it where we need it. And again, in theory, this is great, but uh, things like legislation and individual state laws have kind of stopped this because if you need power from Nebraska and you, you want to put that power in Chicago, well, there's a bunch of states in between that are flyover states. Those states aren't going to benefit from lines just passing through. Yeah, going right over so their house. Like, why, why should I do this, right? And essentially it stops right there. Um, but how far, like, the power is going to obviously not just be able to travel that distance without having massive loss, right? Like, you're yeah. going to have... I mean, typically when you have a... Like, distance is going to lose... Yeah, you, and this is why the, the voltage has stepped up tremendously. Um, you have a very high voltage very low resistance. It can travel very far. Now, one of the things that I know some OEMs are doing and looking heavily into, um, currently transmission lines are AC voltage. Um, but you can, you can travel electricity extremely far with high voltage DC. Hmm. So, you know, some industries are looking into high voltage DC lines as a, as a solution for that. And what are you going to get into Edison and, um, what was it? Edison and Tesla debate. Yeah. There. DC versus AC. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's very, it's a very loaded That's interesting. topic. I've, I've seen like the old photos of when DC was in New York and it was like million power lines to do the same thing. Mm -hmm. And now when they switch to AC, which was probably, you know, 1900s, early 1900s, it kind of alleviated all that. I, I never thought of DC, which it's nice because it's, it's safer relatively. You can't yeah. really, you're not going to have the same amperage, right? Or would you? That like, I don't know. When I'm thinking about car DC, I'm like, oh, you could just hold two power cords and you're not going to yeah. die. But then when you think about house power, I'm like, eh. Well, anything is going to have to be converted back to AC because, I mean, they're just going to look at that for an interim solution on to get how to get power from, you know, east coast to west coast type thing. Oh, like big distance. Yeah. I, and, and, and if currently, right, um, you know, we can kind of transition over to solar. Uh, solar production is in DC already. So that is actually, let me jump back here to the last problem with, uh, wind. with wind production is you have multiple power outputs. So typically nuclear power plants, combined cycle gas power plants, um, coal power plants, fossil steam, everything is produced in synchronous AC, right? So synchronous being wavelength and height, everything is mm -hmm synchronous wind turbines are asynchronous ac and it's because they wind oscillate. is up and down exactly so that asynchronous ac has to be turned into synchronous ac prior to going on the grid so this this kind of factors into some of their losses right mm -hmm. um, now going on to going on to solar solar production is already in dc and solar panels aren't very efficient to begin with they're only i think their typical average efficiency is about 18 percent so 18% of the sunlight or, you know, all available energy this panel is seeing, only 18% of it's getting turned into DC electricity. And then that DC has to be converted into AC prior to going on the grid. So when you say 18% efficiency, that means when they're getting sunlight, yep. that means 18%. So when they're actually, if, Eight. you, if you consider 24 hours a day, mm -hmm. how much, like then it really goes down because exactly. you're only measuring when they're actually seeing sunlight. Exactly. Not the other eight hours, six, whatever it is, 12 hours in yeah. some places. And this is just assuming it's sunny all day, right? Like yeah. you know, there's still thunderstorms, cloud coverage. Um, so, and again, that's another problem with solar is just like wind, you have all this installed capacity and it's, it's sunny out. And then you have a thunderstorm roll in, boom, you lose you lose that capacity on the grid like that. No. Well, and that it, happens in Florida constantly. Exactly. <laughs> and there's a fair amount of solar plants in, in Florida, right? But 
where, where solar is again, most lucrative in the country, right. Would be like the Southwest, like that desertous area where nobody lives to begin with. Yeah. A, nobody lives there. Exactly. Or we don't need it. And, and B, you can't, you can't get the power from there to somewhere else when it's needed. Mm -hmm. Um, now I will say like if, if there's a long term sort storage solution that, that is invented or that comes up, that's going to be a huge game changer. That's what I was thinking. I was like, there's no real storage. You can't, batteries are not yep. efficient, price efficient enough for any power company to invest in batteries. Exactly. And I, and, and this is where my, this is where my inner conspiracy theorists comes out. The, the energy industry in America alone is a multi trillion dollar industry. The only, it's only second to oil and gas. So in the event... And they're very connected. <laughs> exactly. So in the event someone were to come up with a long-term storage solution that would, I don't want to say make obsolete, but make power production far less lucrative, you know, part of me thinks, would, would it ever actually come to fruition? Yeah. Like it's kind of like big pharma and like, you know, a cure for cancer. I was, I was thinking that comparison. It's like, why would you sell them the cure? Yeah. And everybody knows like the you pharmaceutical the industry medicine. does not create cures. They create customers. Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, maybe I'm just being, I think it's in their best interest to protect their industry. Mm -hmm. I understand that. Obviously it's, it goes against helping people, Yeah, but that's how capitalism kind of works. You have to go in the best interest yep. of yourself. And if there's something that doesn't, doesn't benefit your bottom line, when you have these investors that want more money every year, you kind of end up in that situation. Very true. Yeah. It's not exactly as malicious as we would think. Mm -hmm. It's more just protecting yourself in a way. Yeah. In Militian, I guess. <laughs> it's a malicious way to protect yourself. At the cost of? Mill billions of people. Billions of people. Yeah. The environment, you know. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's how it works, though, unfortunately. Yeah. I don't support that, but I, I'm sure that there is a lot that we don't know about, and I don't know if it'll ever come out in our lifetime. I know that there's been plenty of people that have talked about Tesla's free power. Yeah. His production. Like I said, I lived on Long Island. That's where he tested all this stuff. Mm -hmm. And that's been talked about my whole life is like central Long Island. He was testing all these free power stuff. And then suddenly every patent he filed disappeared. Yeah. And that's... it's like, oh, it kind of makes sense. Like, why would anybody allow that? Especially when we're talking about the time where he was competing with, you know, Rockefeller and people that actually did this kind of stuff, like yeah. oil and gas industry and moved oil and gas. and Yeah, you're going against, you know, corporate giants. Yeah, but that's just, a, that's just a side tangent, I guess, from the main thing. So in Florida, we have a weird situation because we get rocked by natural disasters, mm -hmm. absolutely wrecked. Yep. And that's that poses such a difficult problem, I feel like, for the power companies because – you have to figure out how you get your fuel source in mm -hmm. reliably and how you make it safe. Like, yeah, we were talking about nuclear, but like if you put a nuclear power plant right on the either coast of Florida, mm -hmm. you're probably going to get hit by a hurricane. Yeah. In the five years of it being even built, you're probably going to get hit. Well, they're, they're pretty robust, uh, you know, all things considered. And I, I will say, uh, because of that, uh, that's exactly why there's no wind in Florida because of the hurricanes, right? They would just get destroyed. Um, but there are currently uh, two nuclear plants in South Florida, pretty much pretty close to the coast. Mm -hmm. And they've been there for a while. Uh, there's one in, uh, there's one called Turkey Point, And then there's one called uh, Port St. Lucie. Oh, yeah. I've heard of that one. Yep. Um, so they, and, and both of those are, you know, they're pretty much well exposed to the elements. Now, granted, in certain... In certain conditions, they're prevented from running, right? You can't, uh, they're not going to have it run to, to risk, uh, you know, any type of failure or anything like that. All right, the number one nuclear, the, I guess the number one cause for nuclear accidents is inadequate cooling for the reactor, right? So if they can, they can mitigate that or prevent it, they're, they're going to do it. And I think there's, 
in the nuclear industry, they have so many redundancies mm-hmm. or like, you know, okay, well, what if this happens? And what if this, I mean, if you look at the flow chart, it's like, you can't even follow it. It's just, it's like, you know, uh, if it's 78 degrees outside and the moon's crescent, it's still showing at 10 in the morning. Like, what do we do? And, yeah. Uh, so they have, I mean, they have, uh, they try to think of things before they happen, uh, which is probably the best. Typically, I think, I think we read a fact one time that most accidents that happen, uh, could have been prevented prior, but aren't aren't started to like, at least be mitigated until after something happens, right? Even if someone knows it's a potential issue. Yeah. Now, who regulates that? Is that government regulated, or so, is that self governed? No. Uh, the NRC regulates the nuclear, mm-hmm. um, and then the energy industry in general is is regulated. So you have two big regulating. Uh, there's, there's a lot more than two, and I just don't know because some of them are regionalized. Mm-hmm. But the big ones, you have FERC, which is the Federal Energy Reliability Council, um, because te- technically, right, electricity is a national security. It's a national protected uh, entity. Interesting. And then you have NERC, which is the North American Energy Regulatory Committee. I might have got those two yeah, mixed something up. along because the lines. ERC and the ERC from both like I, I some kind of, of multi letter organization yep. that oversees it, but um, and they're under government. Yeah, and the North American one isn't just the United States, so that's also Canada and that's also uh, a little bit of Mexico as well. Mm-hmm. Um, Interesting. So that's like a pact then at that point. That's not even that's yeah. like a treaty between mm-hmm. the three countries in North America. It's different than I guess. Yeah, and, just and a I, government organization. Because you have a lot of things that are intertwined. But yeah, um, one thing I thought you might find interesting, actually, and this is a, a a little bit on that line, though. So, like in America, right? There's three different sub grids, if you mm-hmm. want to say. So there's there's like the eastern region, there's the western region, and then there's ERCOT, which is Texas. They're just like ask. Yeah, America. they have their own, right? Yeah, we want to be by ourselves. Yeah, um, yeah, we don't need no go- stinky government. Hasn't worked out. Super great for them in yeah. a couple instances, but and I, and I can I can speak to the to the, the most recent the winter one, but the main reason these are divided is the Rocky Mountains, right? Because they prevent or they don't prevent, but they they kind of they make it very it, difficult yeah. for power to get from one side to the other. Um, and now ERCOT, right? They are the Energy Reliability Council of Texas, so they are self regulated. Um, they don't want any government oversight. Now, uh, I mentioned earlier these these grid operators, right? The grid has like this threshold. If you can imagine, like, if you can imagine like a seesaw, right? There's frequency and there's voltage, and this frequency and voltage has to stay within these upper and lower parameters for the grid to operate smoothly. Um, typically, if it travels beyond one of these boundaries. Um, Shortly after, there's either going to be a brownout or a blackout, right? Things will fail. Like the grid's either overloaded mm-hmm. or uh, because there's there's too much demand and not enough supply. Or so real quick, inverse. difference between a brownout versus blackout then? Uh, brownout is, I think, and I can't really give you the details, not because I, I can't share it, just because I'm not, I don't want to misspeak. I'm not, yeah. I'm, I think a brownout is when you lose power because you were chosen to lose power. A blackout is when everybody loses power because oh, okay. there was no choice. So brownouts are kind of on purpose to yeah. save, to prevent and the that's damage kind of, of the grid. And that's kind of what happened with the ERCOT situation. So it was winter, right? Everybody is, it's just, winter is really no different than summer. The Winter and summer are the both highest demands on the grid. Fall and spring are typically the, the most mild seasons of the year. So Is that because heat and AC? Exactly. Okay. So it's winter. Uh, they had like that uncharacteristically cold season or yep. week or whatever. Um, they draw a lot of uh, power off of wind, which a lot of those turbines were frozen over. Um, and they had every available plant that could run dispatched, but it was not enough for the demand on the grid, right? So this, the demand was too high, the supply was too low, and it went beyond one of these parameters. And ERCOT, 
for example, um, they have a 10 minute timer. So once it breaches this boundary, you have 10 minutes to correct it or the grid auto shuts down on its own. Oh, wow. It's not a lot of time. It is not. So they're calling on everybody, right? They're trying to get power. Um, they're like, oh, you know, is there anything we can do? You know, and more or less with, with, I think the number was like less than a minute, you know, they had to start shutting power off to places that they had to choose. Right. So they prioritized places like hospitals and nursing homes and stuff mm -hmm. like that, but but communities in whole, right? Yeah, yeah. I would imagine that's pre-decided. It's, you know, it's not like yeah, some guy yeah. deciding on the fly, like, oh, this person, no. I no. don't know. It, it might be, I would I would hope it's pre-decided. Yeah, you would like to think so, but I yeah, I don't, I don't know that it was. I don't know that it is. I, uh, I'm not sure how they operate, but long story short, some people got shafted, right? And then Yeah, that's where I worry, like, low income, like, you know, like yeah. you shut, like, that's where I worry, like, oh no, like, is that, are you now, are you deciding like higher income areas or lower income? That's what I would only worry yeah, about is sure. if it's not pre-decided, like. That's a good, yeah. I would imagine they probably predetermined like high populated areas, like, like cities and stuff, which you would think would be opposite, right? Cause they probably use more power, but yeah. I think they're shutting down like rural areas, like massive neighborhoods, um, it would make sense to leave a city on, in my opinion, because if one building is warm, you yeah. know, that's good for, you know, 50,000 people could kind of pile into a building if they had to. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you leave one house warm, unless nobody's getting in there. Yeah, unless you're Joel Osteen. Yeah, that was uh, that was pretty fun. I like I like when he locked his church. That's, that's a good it's yeah. a good move. Hey, you guys cold? Oh, sucks. Oh, it's <laughs> wet out here. Better lock this door. <laughs> Gosh, keep Get the on the plane. Out Peasants. <laughs> yeah, so somebody has to decide in one minute which neighborhoods well, that, are going down. And I don't know if it's like, I don't know how, you know, it's not like a video game where you see like a bar that's going down and like, oh, yeah, you know, like it's it's probably more of a guess than it is like an exact yeah, and science. I, you know, they, they, they took almost as much time as they could, right? But it, that's like a classic... You know, the classic example of like, do you do you run over these five people on this train the trolley? Track? Yeah. yeah, exactly. The, the trolley situation. So yep. and, and I mean, I wouldn't want to be placed in that situation. No, that's a tough one. So I'm sure he doesn't want to be named who had to do that. I don't know who it was. And I'm sure there's a reason that no one knows. <laughs> yeah, that's a really tough situation. I mean, good on him. He had to do what he did. And he kind of probably made the best decision with the information he had at the time. Because yep. that's really what it comes down to. We can look back on it mm -hmm. and say, oh, you did this, this, and this wrong. But, like, he probably had limited information or they, as a group, yeah, had very limited time and information. So that's a tough one. Hopefully he got a bonus. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but and that's part of the problem, right? When you have, when you have a lot of capacity, uh, and part of the problem, at least with, with renewables, when you have a lot of capacity like that that's in renewables, and typically the renewable capacity isn't huge, but like if you're, if you're talking like five or 10% of your, of your state's power, right? I mean, 10% is a pretty large number when you consider like the entire population. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, and a lot of their capacity is from wind and, you know, you don't have that on. Well, does do that do? mostly end up helping rural areas then wind and cause like, yeah, I would imagine if it's already out there in the rural areas, it ends up mostly end up going to those areas. Yeah, I, and I know that like, you know, in the Midwest, right, the, the plains where a lot of the solar, or a lot of the wind is, um, a lot of those places are probably powered renewably. Um, you know, in Florida, it's a big thing where these solar folks are, you know, calling you left and right. And, and I'm not against that. I mean, I know like even my in-laws, they have solar on their house and they oftentimes don't pay an electric bill. Um, I'm not against it in that front, but you know, it's just, it's not that they, they don't pay an electric bill because they make enough power to consume. It's because, you know, they make enough power and the, the comp, the utility company uses it to offset because they're at nighttime, your lights are on, right? Yeah. You're not powering that with solar, but they've, you know, the utility company has already used whatever solar they're making to offset that cost for whatever they're going to use at night. Yeah, so they're giving it to the neighbors during the day. Exactly. And then at night, they're kind of just kicking it back to them. Yeah, because it, it's a two-way street, which people, some people don't know, right? Like your power 
from the solar is is it's benefiting the utility company as well, right? Mm-hmm. That's that's a you know micro solar farm that they don't have to build because you did it for them on your house. Yeah. Um, so, but if we go back to that power demand curve, so you were really re- you were you were dead on the peak of demand is in the evening when people are getting home from work and you know like oh, let me fire up your washing machine you're cooking dinner exactly tv's right. on ac charge, your, charge your car everything all of it <laughs> now the, and the other peak is in the morning right when people wake up so people wake up you know you, you're using the stove cooking breakfast and the other businesses are opening um there's a there's a peak there and then it, it kind of falls off a little bit and then it typically plateaus until the peak in the evening at least for a long time that's how it was now anyone can google this uh, it's called the duck curve but since solar's large implementation starting in like 2008 to 2012 i can't believe they said this in this article but they literally said and i quote researchers have found that the most solar production is in the middle of the day mind-blowing wow yeah, who knew? Give them a bonus. Exactly. Give those guys a raise. So what what happens is as the demand for electricity is falling in the morning to that plateau, solar production is starting to take off. And midday when the demand is, you know, relatively low for the day, solar production is at its peak. Well, then on the flip side, as the the biggest peak of the day is coming up, solar production is falling off. Mhm. So you have this. So they're hoping they can kind of hand off to each other, but there's a gap. No, it creates a grid instability because you have all this demand coming up and supply coming down. So a lot of these plants are now going to be called upon to pick up that slack. And that's how it was for a long time. Well, now these grid operators, they will, they will tell solar plants to turn off. So you have, these solar plants out here that are designed to create electricity, clean mm-hmm. electricity. And they're like, yeah, like, like if you stay running, we're going to have a problem. Right. Yeah. So it, it creates this false sense of low demand on the grid when there's really not a low demand, there's just a huge surplus of solar. And because of that, it, it moves that, that it's, it's moved that demand line down between the peaks. So it kind of looks like a duck which is why they call it the duck curve. Oh, interesting. Um, but that's... Uh, so there's a weird situation where they have to turn them off during peak efficiency. Yes. Or towards the end of peak efficiency just because... <laughs> that's crazy. So that and, that, uh, that and that's the biggest conversation you have with people is, and that, that kind of like melts their mind, is you have wind, which their peak efficiency is when power is not needed, and you have solar, which is the same thing. Mm-hmm. It's not saying like you're not going to use the electricity, like you will at some point or the other. But when you have grid operators saying, "Stop, <laughs> like we yeah. we don't need your power. If if we keep taking your power, we're going to just create more problems for ourselves in the future." Right. It's so unfortunate that we can't store it. Exactly. Like, if that, we could store it, that would be all the issues pretty resolved there. Exactly. Or at least move it. Are there, I guess you could say, like mm-hmm. if you could cover more land with solar in one spot and just get it everywhere that's needed. Yep. I guess those would be the two answers to all that. But, you know, you can't just put a bunch of solar panels out in the Midwest and expect to get anything in Florida is what you're kind of. Exactly. And that's where, to. you know, potential HVDC lines would come in to get, you know, power from here to there. And, and I think that's. That's just the largest battle they have right now is getting the electricity from where it is to where it really needs to be in a time that it needs to be there. And that's what I was saying earlier. If there's a, if there's a long-term storage solution that, that is, you know, I'm sure as we speak, there are hundreds of companies trying to figure this out because Mm -hmm. whoever figures that, I mean, that, that is the next slice bread, right? That is the, that is a game changer. Yeah. Um, for, for not just America, but I mean, globally. That's the two debates though, is finding storage or just finding a way to have true, you know, clean, renewable energy that doesn't, you know, 
require yeah. a billion solar panels to be made overseas. And that's my, my, I mean, I will die on this hill. My number one, I guess, my opinion is that the clean energy that we should go to is nuclear. And I know you, you mentioned your fears, but I could. No, I don't have any fears at all. I'm fully in support of that. Oh, okay. I, I have, I grew up with fears. It was instilled mm. into me as a child mm -hmm. from my educators. And now I have learned and have changed my tone. And I think that is fully the way. And I, I also want to say, probably not my place, but I think 10 years ago, 15 years ago, 20 years ago, those plants were very different mm -hmm. than the current designs that will be rolled out. I will say that uh, that's, that is true um, to, a, to a point. So a lot of the plants that are out there, right, are, are the same plants that were built in the 40s and 50s, right? And there really hasn't been that much new nuclear construction because they have a massive capital cost. Um, there was a plant, I can't remember the name of it, but I, I want to say it was in the Carolinas. And they they were billions, like with a B, over budget. And it got canceled. And like, if you're a resident of the Carolinas, you're going to be paying... You're, generations of your family are going to be paying for that plant that never was built. Yeah. The, the most, like the most recent new construction nuclear plant wasn't really a new construction. It was just the addition of more units at an already existing plant, which is why, and that's in Georgia. That's called a, uh, it's owned by uh, Southern nuclear company and, uh, or Southern company. Uh, it's called Vogel, like V O T G L E. Interesting. And they had two plants already, and then they built two more. I think, as of this conversation, um, one of them is now been commissioned. But even that, even just adding two plants was like a legal nightmare, right? Mm -hmm. Now, I, again, cannot recommend Pandora's Promise enough. I wrote it down. But uh, that will talk about multiple reactors that were designed, right? So every reactor, every commercial reactor currently in America is a light water reactor. Um, light water reactors are reactors that use plutonium and uranium as, as fuels, but they also create a lot of waste. Um, in this documentary, they will talk about they could have went with what's called a breeder reactor. And what it does is it breeds the nuclear fuel until there's almost nothing left. And then mm -hmm. it produces very little waste. But Admiral Rickover uh, had a very, you know, who, who was responsible for the first nuclear submarine, had a very large pool. So what became commercialized was just essentially a large version of what was put in a nuclear submarine. Um, and that's kind of what got commercialized. And now, in those guys' defense, they were like, well, this is just a stepping stone yeah, so the they future. saw it worked. They didn't really have the crazy knowledge that yeah. there was all these other options. They just saw what worked. But to this, to this day, these plants are still, I mean, they eat steam and they mm -hmm. just, they work. Now you have two different types of light water reactors though. Um, you have, I'm trying to remember the term. Oh, you have a PWR, pressurized water reactor. And you have a BWR, which mm -hmm. is boiler water reactor. PWR is what's called a clean reactor. So the water that's cooling the reactor core is separate from the water that's going through the steam turbines. Right? They're two separate loops. Mm -hmm. A boiler water reactor uses the same water that cools the reactor to power the steam turbines. So that that steam is radioactive steam. Yeah. Uh, in a sense, right? Um, so I've worked on... PWR reactors. I've never worked on a BWR, and I'm not gonna lie, I was a little nervous to to do so because if you work certain components of of the plant, you have to dress out. You have to wear a dosimeter, and oh, just wow. the thought of that terrifies me. Yeah. And they're saying like, oh, you know, it's less radiation than you would get from a dental exam. And I'm like, well, I also don't get dental exams. The very classic often. Uh, Geiger counter going off and yeah, that exactly, kind of thing, like right. you hear in like a scary movie. Oh, I know, like the Chernobyl documentary. Yeah, where it's uh, like. Dick, 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 yeah. <laughs> <laughs> not, not a fan. Yeah, I can I can understand that. <laughs> but um, 
There is a reactor that exists in the country now called the IFR reactor, which is an integral fast reactor. This reactor was built as a result of Three Mile Island in Fukushima. Now, what this reactor does, and there's not very many details of it because it's like extremely classified, but it's not theoretical. Like it's built and mm -hmm. they tested it. Uh, and this is in that documentary. What they did, they turned the reactor on. They went critical, which critical just means it's at its normal operating temperature. I, it sounds terrible yeah. to use that as a term. Yeah, um, like but code red it sounds like. Exactly, right? Like, oh, my God, melting down. But they turned it on, and they first uh, simulated Fukushima or Three Mile Island, one of the two. They simply just turned the cooling pumps off. Mm -hmm. and didn't do anything. The operator just sat there. And the reactor has the capability to ramp down on its own. And then later that same day that they, they demonstrated this, they they simulated uh, Three Mile Island or Fukushima. I don't know which one they did first. Um, but they simulated the other one. Same thing. The, the reactor started to get hot, and then it just coasted down. And it was able to either internally regulate or... You know, some kind of computer-generated yeah. software was able to do it, I would imagine. Yeah, and I'm not sure what, what, what it was, but they... Sh and not only that, but this reactor will use its fuel source until it's depleted. There's no waste. Hmm. So in the event that people could pull their head out of their ass yeah. and, you know, build one of these without, you know, miles of red tape and billions of dollars in cost... All the nuclear spent fuel in the country could be used as fuel. Mm -hmm. And granted, I will say, and this is something else that's in that documentary, but the amount of spent nuclear fuel in America is not near as much as, as I thought, and probably not near as much as a lot of other people think. But you could fit all of America's nuclear waste from the time nuclear was started to now, if you stacked it three meters high, in a, fo in a football field. That's all. Yeah. Of and there's plenty of place in the U.S. where we could put that underground or something like yeah, that. Yeah, there's a place, I think, uh, Yucca Mountain is what they what mm -hmm. they use. And, uh, you know, they say, oh, this place will be safe for like 10,000 years. 10,000 years? Like, think about well, where yeah. are we even going to be as a species I've, in 10,000 years? I've heard a little talk about that where how what signage do you use so like what kind of like signage do you put on a you know nuclear waste receptacle that somebody 10,000 years ago that may speak a completely different language most yeah. likely will will be able to interpret as danger cuz you can't just write danger you can't just put the the nuclear sign and they yeah. and expect anybody in a thousand years to understand that for sure yeah so there was like a whole thing about how do you make it like universally recognizable that you don't want to touch this. Yeah. That was an interesting one that I, I heard somebody talking about and like how to design yeah, just a, a logo to, to deter people. Yeah. Like 10,000 years from now, skull and crossbones, a smiley face. <laughs> oh, Hey, it's yeah. it may need, it may need mean nothing. So it's like a, it's, it's a tough debate in itself. One thing that I do like renewable wise is like Lake Mead and Niagara. Oh, yeah. Hydro. I, I enjoy so, hydro. I It seems huge. like it's not in anybody's way. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really affect much. It's you put great. it up, and it just keeps going Yep, 24-7. So hi hydro is a, a fantastic source of renewable energy. The only problem with hydro is all of the available capacity for hydro has already been installed, right? You're not yeah. really... There's not some new lake or something exactly. that you can make. So TVA, uh, the Tennessee Valley Authority, they have tons of hydro because they have tons of rivers in that area. Mm -hmm. And uh, in fact, I believe Canada too, if you look at, uh, you know, if you go to statisto.com and, and you look at uh, fuel source by country and you go to Canada, I'm pretty sure like 60% of Canada's electricity is from, from hydro. Really? Yeah. I didn't think it was so widespread because when I think about hydro, I have a very limited knowledge of like, I know Niagara Falls. I grew up in New York. Yeah. I know Lake Mead. I've been out, I've been out there. I've seen that and all that's very interesting. I mean, that's, yeah, it's, it's pretty huge. And I think, I mean, I, I just recently read that Canada has more lakes than every combined country huh. in the world. I didn't know that. Yeah. Um, but 
Yeah, no, hydro is, is, is great. I mean, it's clean. You're just using water. It's to, truly to spin just a, renewable. It just, it's just a flowing river. You interrupt yeah. it a little bit. Like it's not anything, especially Niagara Falls. I mean, yeah, and some, really some places have built kind of like makeshift. So what will happen is they'll have a reservoir during the day as power is needed. They'll, they've calculated, okay, we'll, we'll flow this much through the turbine and it goes down into a lower reservoir. And at night when the power is not needed, they'll have stored some of that power and they'll pump that water back up to the reservoir for the next day. Oh, wow. Yeah. So they'll use the power that they made to just prepare for tomorrow. Yeah, so it's like perpetual yeah. renewable kind of thing. I know they were worried about Lake Mead drying up for a while. And that's that's part, part of the problem too, right? Which is, is a rare situation. That's not yeah. something that's... I think if that happens, they they got bigger problems than just power. For sure, yep. Now, I will say like in the Northwest, uh, so there was a BWR nuclear power plant I was going to work on. Um, called Columbia Generating Station. It's uh, it's like right on the line of Washington, where like it separates green growth and vegetation and desert. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but that is the, to my knowledge, that is the only nuclear power plant in the country that is not on a typical eighteen month refueling cycle. So typically, um, every eighteen months, they will have to down power one of the reactors to refuel it with nuclear fuel. Um, but there's so much installed hydro up there that in the springtime, when the water's melting from the mountains in Canada and, and in that area, the hydro is so great that they can actually throttle back the nuclear plant. Oh, wow. So they don't have to run it you know, 100%. Yeah. And because of that, they stretch their 18-month cycle to either – either 24 months or something like that. It's some, some weird number, mm -hmm. but they're the only ones that don't have to run at base load all the time. Yeah. Which huh. is interesting. That's pretty cool. I've, I've even heard a lot about, um, like underwater in current ones. Too. Yeah, there are, I don't know how, uh, I've heard a lot of talk about it. I don't know if anything's been implemented. In college, I had to learn about a whole bunch of renewable energies. I took it as a class because, uh, when I was in college, I actually still worked in the industry. Um, but, yeah, tidal is one of them. Yeah, um, they kind of what they do is they they build like a concrete structure and they funnel these tidal waves into essentially like a flap that mm -hmm. it oscillates, but it turns that oscillating motion into a rotating motion, which then turns a generator. Um, there's geothermal, which is really cool. Um, I think. Uh, it's like Sweden or the Netherlands or something like that. That does sound like of, it would be an interesting one. That yeah. seems like it would be an instant forever power. But it, these are very localized, right? So you yeah. can't do, uh, but like, you know, you could do something like that in Hawaii potentially. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they produce a lot of steam. The downfall of that is like there's a lot of sulfur output. Um, so then you're kind of, you know, in terms of like climate change activists, like, oh, it's, you're still. Yeah. I kind of like the idea of like the title one because it puts people in a tough spot where, you know, if you're like a activist, mm -hmm. you're like, do I save the fish or am I saving yeah. the environment? You know, you kind of build an internal debate in somebody's brain yeah. where you kind of have to decide like even with like wind turbines, it's like, oh, but it's damaging farmland and the kids yeah. kills birds, hawks fly into them. And that's my biggest argument to people that are climate change activists or environmentalists is – you know, you want this, you want this renewable energy, um, but a you're you're installing hundreds of thousands of acres of solar panels, right? And like a footprint that's so large that makes up that only makes a fraction of what a power plant like a nuclear power plant or a combined cycle power yeah. plant produces. And on top of that, like it's not an environmental friendly task to make these solar panels yeah like silica mining uh lithium mining for batteries uh even even so um wind turbines the the wind turbine blades a lot of them are carbon fiber when they have reached end of life or they get damaged they they're not repurposed they, they haven't figured out a way to so there's a guy i mean more power to him is capitalistic guy but yeah some guy in the midwest is charging companies to just store these 
wind turbine blades That's on his property. Great. He's got like thousands of acres. He's like, bring them on by. Yeah, just put them on my yeah, land. We'll put them on with the rest. And there's just thousands of blades, right? I I'm, bet you he thinks the government's going to eventually have to to step in and pay to get them gone off. His I mean, he's already too. he's already getting paid, right? So I yeah. mean, I, I, and then I bet you he's going to get another <laughs> end end of the line payday where they like have to take it out because now it's an environmental hazard. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Don't they use like sixty gallons of oil too? They, they have to do oil change on. They them do have like yeah. Massive. So the the nacelle of a wind turbine right is is where the generator is housed. There's like a reduction gear, um, you know, as the the, the blades spin and the prop spins, right? It spins a reduction gear to get the generator to spin at whatever they needed uh, to produce the power. But yeah, they, it's oiled as well. Um, there's, there's a lot of technology in those. I, I've, I've only been at a training facility. I've never actually been in, in like in an actual one. Cause they're like 300 feet tall. Yeah. I've always wanted to go up in one. Yeah. I'm not a, I'm not a heights guy. Like even, even like a power plane, if I have to climb, like, you know, I have to climb sometimes up to like, let's say like 20 stories yeah. on like, you know, metal stair and scaffolding and stuff like that. And I look down, I'm like, Oh my God, I'd give it a try. If I had the opportunity to go up one, I, I don't know how easy it is to get up one. Don't so there's, climb there, it? there, there, there la there's ladders on the inside and they're, they're typically built in three sections. So you have, you know, the base is obviously a bigger diameter than the top, but you go up one ladder, then you get to a floor. Yeah. So you have some landings. Ladder, yeah. And typically you have a, you have a harness, you have a carabiner, you have a, uh, sometimes I think they have a skate. So like if you fall, it'll, it'll grab. Mm -hmm. Um, and they do, I know they do, uh, training exercises where if you're in the nacelle and let's say someone's having a heart attack or something, they have a door where you can just like repel essentially all the way Oh, down. wow. And, uh, super not a fan of that. Yeah. Well, they have to get like heavy equipment up there sometimes too. So that I've seen they have like a pulley system, yep. with like a winch. And that's the same thing that you would, that you would essentially, you would use that to go down. Yeah. That's kind of fun. I mean, so, I mean, on. they have all this, all this, uh, a parachute at least. I mean, yeah. Right. Get hit by the fan, <laughs> hit yeah. by the blade. <laughs> Dude, the blade tip speeds of those things are, I don't know what it is, but I mean, if you, if you think, I mean, diameter wise, I mean, you've seen them in person, they're huge, mm -hmm. right? Blade tip speeds like hundreds of miles an hour. There's a cool YouTube genre of them failing. Oh. There's like a whole video, like there's like a video series of them just like, like one like blade will be on fire and they're just like spinning around and like, or like it's smoking in the center and like it just like lawn, lawn sails itself, whatever. And like everything's just gone. It's, it's a fun, it's a fun and series they, to go and down. And they have built technology where, you know, those blades can move and try to deflect some of the wind. But yeah. And a tornado, like, what are you going to do? Yeah, right? like <laughs> exactly. It's like a helicopter. You can probably tilt the blades yep. to get the to get the lift and whatever. And I want to say, like, the entire face of the fan can turn towards the wind, right? Because hmm. solar panels, right, they'll build them from, like, east to west, and they can rotate. I think it's the same thing for solar panels because the wind doesn't always blow in the same direction. I get a kick out of the, uh, the solar in Disney, how they kind of put it as, like, a look at this. You know, oh, you like yeah. drive by it when you're going to Disney and they're like, it's shaped like Mickey ears. Yeah. Look at it. It's probably not doing that much, but because they have other power plants too. I've heard they got some interesting. Yeah, they actually do have their own combined cycle gas turbine power plant. I've heard uh, they use like their own garbage to make some power too. They use that system. They, they do a lot. I, I think, uh, I mean, I know when Epcot was first built, it was supposed to be, you know. Self-sustaining. Epcot's an acronym for something. It's like the... Something, something, something of tomorrow. I know what the OT is, but it's yeah. like kind of like the the town of tomorrow or something, you know. Hmm. Yeah, that they have a lot of cool stuff going on there. I, yeah, it's it's. I think it's very interesting. The uh, like, and I don't mind like solar if you're going to use it on like an existing structure. Like for example, like when you're putting wind on farms, it's like land that's already being used for something. Like you're not going to build something there. Yeah. Sure, go for it. But when you're when you're an environmentalist and you're all for renewables and then you're just taking out thousands of acres of, of growth for really a minimal mm -hmm. output of electricity. I'm like, come on. Like now if you're going to put it on like homes, roofs, your own property or something like that, you know, it, it makes a lot more sense. But yeah, when you actually have a location already and you're not disrupting anything, I, I definitely yeah. get that. And I mean, there's a, there's, a reason solar's you know huge too. I mean, obviously there's government subsidies, right? You know, uh, a lot of these companies are going to take advantage of that. Uh, actually, in Florida, 
a lot of the solar plants are just shy of 75 megawatts. And the reason is if as soon as you hit that 75 megawatt threshold, it's considered something else and you, you don't, you don't have that kickback or whatever. So oh, companies so. would rather make a bunch of little 75 megawatt plants instead of making one massive. You're going to say government is ruining something. That's crazy. I would yeah. never have guessed that. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I thought they always had our best be on my freaking mind. tombstone. <laughs> <laughs> we had one of our old shop in Clearwater that was a, it was on the dump site and it would make electricity based. They would just dump trash into it basically. Oh, okay. And I had a buddy that worked on it and he's like, if you ever see like a lot of steam coming out of it, that's when they call me and that's when something's going really wrong. Uh, and it did that a lot. <laughs> <laughs> More than I thought. <laughs> Yeah, a lot of these coal power plants that the government has kind of like really cracked down on. In terms clean coal? Of, yeah, clean coal. Clean coal? Uh, you know, those are those are essentially just fossil steam turbine units, right? They, You have a boiler room that, you know, replace nuclear reactor with... You're just turning a turbine, right? Well, you're creating steam to turn a turbine. Yeah. So how you create that steam is just a heat source, right? That's all these power plants have in common. So this fossil steam turbine can burn anything to create heat, right? Like coal has a very, coal is cheap, has a very high heat rate. So it's it's easy to burn coal. Obviously, and, and like the byproducts of coal were used to make drywall, to make, I think they used part of it in making concrete. Um, so it, it served a purpose. Yeah. And, and that's definitely not going to go anywhere. But a lot of those plants can burn anything, right? They can burn trash, which... Some places do, but you know, when you start burning things that you have no idea, like what's going in, then you're going to obviously have emissions that, you know, fluctuate. Not ideal. Yeah. So, uh, start dumping it, plastic into it. Yeah, just because. exactly. But it, the thing with like a, a natural gas turbine power plant is their emissions are heavily restricted. And, and what a lot of people don't understand is they're monitored like on a daily basis. Like if they, if they go over too many PPM CO or NOx, they're immediately like, called like hey hey what's what's going on and mm. and they'll be fine pretty heavily and again nobody wants to pay money they want to make money so yeah they uh they're going to do anything that they can there's also uh companies that they're heavily involved with environmental agencies um so nuclear being one of them uh you have to draw cooling water off of you know some body of water some body of water yeah. right so that's why everyone's off of a river or three mile island coast and- exactly so the discharge water has to be no more than a certain agreed upon temperature to not affect the environment. But some of these plants have been around so long that let's say they try to keep it, I think, within like 10 degrees. But let's say that discharge temperature is always around 65 degrees. Well, in the wintertime, when the body is water colder, that 65 degrees is going to be a lot warmer. Yeah, so that's a lot animals like fish and manatees and stuff will go to that water because of that these plants now let, let's say they're in the middle of a of an outage whether it be planned or forced they're required to artificially heat that water when they're not running and and to yeah. essentially because they've they've slightly altered the environment in that area so the one up here duke i think it is heats for heats Tampa Bay and okay. all the manatees flock to it. Yep. It's very known thing in the winter. Mm-hmm. If you go there, you're going to see a couple hundred manatees. They're all right there. And I just learned this. So, and I don't know, I'm sure they do it here, but in the, in the winter time, manatees will choose warmth over food. And typically by these discharge, oh. there's no grass to eat. So FWC in places, they'll buy thousands of pounds of lettuce and go feed them because they're not going to leave. Okay. And they'll probably also breed there as well. But, oh, so they would just, they would end up just killing themselves. They would. Just sitting there in the warmth. Yep. I, I literally just learned this yesterday. Crazy. Yeah. So now, <laughs> so now they just like have to keep doing more and more. And then before you know it, they're just like, they're just captive at this point. Yeah. Like, they're just our pets. Like, yeah. Cause you kind of like ca- catch yourself in the next thing. Like you have the next problem that you didn't expect. And I feel like that is always the case mm-hmm. where like, you try to help and then you try to help again and you're just all of a sudden now you have a captive group of 200 manatees that are yeah. your pets. And some of them, you know, 
Sometimes it's like in the thousands of how many will like flock to these dishes. We get a lot down here. It's insane. A lot of them end up in the rivers though because they naturally end up warmer. Oh, okay. Just like they go up into like Crystal River and stuff like that, which oh, nice. is fairly local to us. But um, let's switch from power stuff. Let's talk about your cars a little bit here. So oh, yeah. you race, you have a bunch of projects, you brought something cool here that we're looking at. It is a six cylinder manifold, but not any six cylinder we would probably expect. <laughs> yeah, it's the, the Lord six cylinder. The <laughs> probably one of the only real American inline sixes yep. gasoline. Yeah, so the uh the Vortec forty two hundred uh out of the O two to O nine Trailblazer among in other cars. Actually Saab had a had a forty two hundred in they like used a nine seven X or something. Well they kind of used Chevy's cars for a little while there. Yeah, I know some people have the done Trailblazer that. SS yeah. Is also made as a Saab. Oh, I did not know There's that. There's like an XC9 oh, then that's Saab what, or something. Okay, then that's what it was. That's also a Trailblazer SS. Oh, you could get them cool. in both trims. Nice. You could get them with the V8 LS, or you could get it base model. Yeah, I think those companies like, you know, Isuzu and Nissan, I think they did that to kind of avoid certain costs, you know, in terms of like shipping. So they would produce yeah. something here with similar tooling. Uh, but yeah, I know it's in the GMC Envoy. Um and it was in like a couple of other random vehicles, but it's a very stout motor. Um, so this is uh, manifold by Artec. Yeah, um, so it's a cast. What is that? Cast stainless? That's a great question. I actually don't know. I, I want to say. I would imagine it's stainless. I, I don't know. Cast he, iron, maybe? I don't know. He's made. I mean, it feels. I think it's. I've seen them for the, the 2J machine. stuff before. So we're looking at a pretty cool. You know, V-band, I mean, um, divided housing. Oh, that's a crazy port design on that, too. Yep, uh, 60 millimeter uh, wastegate port. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, their their motors, I think, are very, very unique. Uh, they actually, they were in the racing industry pretty much out of the gate, and they've been around for a long time. Just nobody really talks about them. Um, so they sold, like, GM was, like, hell-bent on taking over certain like front wheel drive like racing this is like in the ecotech age right yeah so you know they sold the 4200 as a crate motor and they and they put in teams there's a i don't know the name of the class in the nhra competition there's not that much extreme. tuning available available on them that was always the seemed like the slowdown yeah so well i mean you can get any standalone and wire it in for a six cylinder uh, mm -hmm. it's obviously a lot easier than a five cylinder um but so the 08 and 09, um, like I have a Trailblazer that's an 09 that I'm building, which is what this is for. Yeah. The 08 and 09, in 08, they went to speed density. So tuning a 2008 or 2009 is just like tuning an LS. Okay. Um, which is, it, it makes it extremely easy. Um, now I will say the 4200 is the first motor GM made that had VVT on it. It only has VVT on the exhaust, but it still picked up uh, surprisingly large amount of power. So the, ol the only reason I'm into this motor is uh, I have a good buddy, Calvin Nelson. Uh, I think he was mentioned when you had Matt Happel on. He he, he brought him up uh, briefly. Yeah. But, uh, you know, he has a YouTube channel, uh, Nivelac 57. He is almost single-handedly pioneered this motor. He holds like, I mean, a dozen records for it. He made on a stock long block, and I'm talking like stock sealed, I think like 620 wheel horsepower. Okay. He built his own. This is prior to him getting an Artec manifold. Now, yep. him and Artec were kind of like working hand in hand to develop this. Uh, but he built his own turbo kit that was air to water intercooler. Um, he will use a gold box and piggyback with a stock computer so he can control the VVT. Uh, but I think on like 20 pounds of boost or 25 pounds of boost, he's picked up as much as 50 horsepower just by playing with the cam angle and the exhaust VVT. Mm -hmm. Uh, now the cylinder head can flow really well. Now, now that that NHRA class that I mentioned, um, I think it's like extreme competition or something. It's the class where you're limited by your cubic inch and you're just trying to get as much power as possible. But there's a there's a couple of guys that use this motor. I I've recently found out they passed away, but they were turning ten thousand RPM out of a forty two hundred, naturally aspirated, making over six hundred horsepower. I think I've seen one before. At one point in my travels, I saw one person with like 
what looked like a pro mod mm -hmm. and I just couldn't make out the engine at first because yep. it's it it was also probably four five years ago ish okay and it had a lot of stock stuff on it mm -hmm. which really throws you off because you're seeing a pro mod with like you know stock coils on and stock looking intakes and stuff yeah. like that it was very weird to see but he was doing that <laughs> and he goes to do his burnout and I was like all pumped kicked a rod out right in the burnout oh, box no. I was like uh oh, I was so excited to watch this but yeah that was my only ever that was my first introduction of seeing somebody drag race one oh, so it was really? a bad introduction yeah that does <laughs> suck I, I know in 2005 I think like one of the first drag weeks if not the first there was a 66 Nova wagon that had a 4200 in it I think he made like 1300 crank mm -hmm. I unfortunately apparently he cheated so he got got booted but uh he went 862 in the quarter and it, not a very light car at all yeah um so they they can make you know a lot of power i know with cams they made uh calvin made 740 wheel and on a built motor uh, really just rods and pistons um he may have already made it i think they were shooting to make a thousand on their uh fairmont which has this yeah. motor in it a very very stout engine so it's enough to I think it's really a you know everybody's looking for a new platform. You know they're not making really LSs anymore. No, and they made I mean millions of these engines, right? Uh, Our tech obviously thought it was good enough to create a product for it, and I think if more companies got on board with it, it could definitely be a worthwhile supplement to either an LS or definitely a two J, right? I mean you, you're familiar two Js; they're not cheap. No, um, it's it's kind of like this: the two J, the Barra. RBs, eh, they suck. Don't don't even don't even talk to me on the RB stuff. They suck. <laughs> but it's like this: the Barra and a two J are kind of if you want an inline six cylinder. Obviously, yeah. people race Cummins, but they're a thousand pounds undressed. So yeah, and, the, and this motor <laughs> has a lot of similarities with the two J. Like uh, this and the two J both have seven main caps. Mm -hmm. uh, this actually, I'm not sure if a two J has a main girdle or not, but this motor does. No. It's just um, two bolt. Oh, okay. Two bolt mains. Very yeah. simple. So, like the forty two hundred has a main girdle, which yeah. is a little bit, you know, kind of gives it that rigidity. Yeah, iron block, right? No, aluminum block. These are aluminum block. Yep. Oh wow, so they're probably pretty light. And they're, then. I think they're T three fifty six aluminum, so it's a very strong yeah. aluminum. It's not, you know, like a standard uh, hmm. that you would find in like a a Kia, right? Yeah, <laughs> it looks like it's made out of tin foil. I'd be curious how much warpage a block that long aluminum gets because even the two J's we twist the blocks a little oh, bit really? yeah and, we, and that's how you that's how your head gaskets really start oh, to go is interesting you twist the whole block yeah I'm not sure I I mean I haven't I don't have enough experience in it I I know you know the motors that that Calvin and them have built have been pretty stout um they built and GM actually made uh, I know I sent you a link I don't know if you got a chance to read it GM made a twin turbo 4200 hmm. and put it in a trailblazer back in 2002 when they first came out with it. So they, I think they had a lot of goals for the engine, but. I think that was their original thing because they were working on this in the Vortec world mm -hmm. before the LS really took off. Yeah. And they were kind of doing the same at the same time. And I think market just dictated LSs. Yeah, I mean, cost production. I mean, the LS is probably just worlds cheaper. Yeah. Then they were able to put it in all the trucks. They mm -hmm. were probably imagining maybe they were thinking fuel shortages or something along those lines. So let's develop something with torque. Yeah. That doesn't use as much gas as an LS. And then that didn't happen. So, which is questionable because my trailblazer is not the best. <laughs> yeah. I, I would wonder if that's how much that, that takes into play. There's so much logistics that probably happened behind the scenes there at GM at this time. Yeah. That we don't even know about why this engine didn't become more mass produced. Well, um, that article, um, Motor Trend did the article about the twin turbo when they built, and uh, it only made like 400 horsepower. But uh, Ron Kosiba was the chief uh, GM engineer for this for this engine. I actually reached out to him trying to like talk to him. I, I haven't I haven't heard back, but uh, I think that what killed the motor really was the was the economy crash in 08 uh, because the factory that built these engines shut down. Mm -hmm. So naturally 09 was the last year and then they just, you know, it kind of got mothballed. But, you know, in the in that article, uh, they were quoted on, 
they were asked, well, why, why did, why 400 horsepower? And the other engineer was like, ah, oh, it just sounded like a nice number. And the other, uh, Ron Kosiva was like, yeah, but it can make a lot more if we want it to. And hearing them say that was, was pretty interesting. Now, granted the motor that they used wasn't the same 4,200. They, like every manufacturer, they beefed it up like beyond yeah. existence. Um, but, uh, I still think that it's it's got a lot of a lot of meat on the bones for for any companies that really want to produce parts for it. I mean, being someone that's building one, naturally I want someone to yeah. build parts. <laughs> I'd be curious to see some more max effort stuff because sometimes with an engine like this and with classes that are really competitive, you can kind of like skirt some rules by using something that's not in the rule book explicitly very true yeah so like you know there's obviously big block rules small block chevy that kind of stuff but mm -hmm. if you're in like a ultra street class or something like that you can kind of kind of squeeze by some rules yeah that's true did you did you follow sick week at all last year yeah did you see that volvo wreck i the much i saw it was like the really old 58 oh PV. yeah yeah yep. so that was calvin nelson's dad actually and they had one of these motors in it um they still don't know why it failed uh because mm -hmm. i know he went back at the log and looked and and there's nothing like it didn't lose oil pressure i think it just let go that's the first major failure they had but it did the same thing as what you were excited about the drag search to see it mm -hmm. shot a rod right through the block yeah that was a terrible wreck man i was i was in the lanes for that yeah it, uh, and, I, and when you say volvo i don't think about that car because it didn't yeah it didn't, exactly to me it didn't resemble a volvo yeah. like when i think about volvo i think about like the the 240s yeah like that's exactly. what people drag race no it was a really unique car and i you know fortunately i was able to come to his house and help him work on it uh prior to them coming down to sick week so it was really sad it was scary to watch because i watched it live and yeah. uh but you know they built that 25 three cage for it and if not for that cage right you know he probably wouldn't have walked away yeah i think that was south georgia that happened it was yeah. it was a crazy wreck man that was one of like the there was two big wrecks on sick week that was yeah that was one of them. it was uh yeah it was hard to watch but um, yeah, they, that was their, their major failure on, on the motor that they've, they've had. They, they've had one where I think they, uh, they spun a rod bearing on one they made like 800 horsepower on, mm -hmm. but they, I would say they probably, other than them, like I know, like I said, PFI speed, I think like 15 years ago, they did a twin turbo supercharged one, like a compound boost. <laughs> I, I think they claimed to make like 2000 horsepower, but I don't know if there was ever any like. Yeah. Any evidence to like support that claim um but yeah i mean they, they've been around and they've been out there i think that you know you can if you go to a junkyard like if i go to a junkyard to buy parts for a 4200 i have literally seen a 4200 motor ripped out of a trailblazer just sitting on the ground right there because yeah. they wanted the trans, the trans or something yeah yeah i mean they all have four sixties, right so it's just a box of neutrals after like yep. hundred fifty thousand miles so you go get another one yeah. and then destroy that one the same way but you can buy an entire trailblazer with a bad transmission for like 800 bucks which is already less than what you're buying an ls motor for i would like to do one in like a two-door short bed colorado if anything because i really awesome. like the colorados especially the two-door short bed ones yep. they're freaking hard to find a nice one now i've i picked up a nice one for my buddy one time and i was like you know i i picked it up for him i i gave the cash and everything and like it was my car at this moment and i was like oh kind of want to keep it <laughs> sorry, sorry champ <laughs> yeah i know uh, i i was really liking this car it was white with black interior too it was like perfect oh nice but that would be the cool that would be a cool swap for one of these so actually, they came with the five cylinder right so so they came with a four or five cylinder so the atlas line right you had the 4200 inline six you had the 3.5 or 3.7 liter five cylinder depending on the year i think the 3.5 was 04 and 05 and then Either 06 or 07, they went to the 3.7. Um, and then you had a 2.8 liter four cylinder. So they had three engines in the Atlas mm -hmm. lineup. Um, I actually have a five cylinder Colorado, which I was one of my mini projects that I'm also building. If you look at the five cylinder, and I think I also read an article about it, it shares 73% of its components with the 4200. So this, I, I could technically cut a runner off of this and bolt it right to the Colorado. Yeah. It's, the, now Lock the, it off a little. Yeah, right. <laughs> the difficult part of the Colorado, though, is on the five cylinder. Is is the five cylinder is definitely hard to tune, right? You can't you can't run waste spark because it's of its ignition timing, and they have 
balance shafts in the rear. Um, I don't know if this is something that Audi does with their five cylinders because, you know, the RS3. Mm -hmm. But I've seen some people have removed them and then they just like weld the ports for where they are. I don't know if that motor is going to vibrate itself to death or if you could just run it with the balance shafts and risk like either stretching the chains or, uh, I don't know. But Yeah, that's a tough one. That's where pioneers do a lot for yeah. the sport. I think five, five cylinders are super cool. Um, and they make some good sounds. Exactly. In yeah. the Audi world, they make awesome sounds. In the Volkswagen world, they make great sounds. I had a five-cylinder, 2.5-liter Volkswagen Golf, and it was like one of the best-sounding cars I've, at least best-sounding non-V8 car I've ever had. Yeah, because they're like half of a Audi, a half exactly. of like a V10 Audi or Lambo at that point. <laughs> exactly. And that's, you know, what's funny is, exactly how the guy you know sold it to me i already knew what i wanted but he's like you got like half of a lambo lambo motor in here i'm like it's gonna sell you the other half we're talking about we're talking about a twenty thousand dollar volkswagen golf yeah motor. like this is not anything of partially lambo it's the classic salesman pitch yeah i love that that's funny so you also um you were telling me a little bit about the grassroots for grassroots yeah racing uh, yep i'm wearing their sporting their stuff so i really like the idea of <coughs> racing on cheap racing budgets and mm -hmm. stuff like that because that's usually everybody's barrier to entry in this sport. Oh, yeah, 100%. And I've talked to a lot of people about this, and if there's less barrier of entry or a little easier to get into, it just helps the entire sport in a whole. And I think yep. the grassroots side, I don't want to hear about that. <coughs> Sorry. So. You're good. This past year was my fifth year competing at the $2,000 challenge, which is what it's called. Um, I think they started back in the early 2000s. But yeah, you they have a very unique event. Um, I would I, I would think the closest thing to I guess compare it to would be like zip tie drags in a in a sense. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, they have a $2000 challenge where you buy and build a car for $2000 or less. And this includes the purchase price of the vehicle. Now, when people initially hear that they're like, there's no way, right? But like any event, if you read the rules, there are certain things that are budget exempt. There are, uh, you are allowed to recoup a certain amount of money, and then you can obviously put that back into the build. Um, but you can never, you can never recoup something for a profit, right? Like if I, if I bought this part for ten dollars, I can't turn around and sell it for a hundred and put $90 back into the budget. Yeah. You can only sell something for what up to what you paid for it. And buy a $10,000 car and then sell, you know, $8,000 worth of parts off of exactly. it. Exactly. And that's in the rules too. Like, so you can never spend more than $2,000 on a car. Yeah. Um, even though, so for the longest time, I think since the event's inception, you could only recoup a thousand dollars. Well, for 2024, they just changed that rule where you can now recoup two thousand dollars. So you can recoup the whole cost of the that's vehicle. It's got to go with inflation, you know. That's you got to rise a little here. To me, it's a game changer because we've all, you know, my a lot of my friends and I have been doing this event for a while, and uh, an extra thousand dollars is like, oh my god, you know what I can do with yeah. an extra thousand dollars? Now this sport uh, or this this event is uh, people that know how to modify stuff in terms of uh, you, you can machine parts or if you have a lathe or you have a bridge port, if you know how to weld, those folks typically excel at this event because... Yeah, you can kind of have free free work at that point. Exactly. Your labor doesn't count, right? Yeah. Um, and you're allowed to have team, team members and stuff like that. Um, you can trade certain parts, uh, which a lot of people will do as well. Um, it, it, it's an incredible sport and... I, being an engineer, I absolutely love seeing stuff that shouldn't work, work. So, uh, for example, last year there was a 1967 Corvair that had a rear engine LT1 mated to an Audi transaxle. Huh. And For $2,000. Yeah. It took him three years to build yeah. because of the budget. He did machine his own adapter plate to fit the transaxle. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it was a, if you look at the car, right, it's like, you know, the, the car was probably a couple hundred bucks. Mm -hmm. the, the money that's spent on the car is like the transaxle. LT ones are dirt cheap. Yeah. Um, I think he bought a pair of magnesium C5 Corvette wheels, which, 
you know, and you have to turn in a build book for this event. So you, so you have to like break it all down. You have to prove, right. And people can contest you, which is pretty rare. Um, you know, in the spirit of the challenge, you, you want to be honorable, right? Mm-hmm. You know, you want to see other people and, and everybody, you know, the great equalizer is the budget. Everyone is at the same mercy that you are. So if you can make something work, other people are going to do the same thing. The, the, my goal it hasn't happened yet. My goal is to have a rule written after me because there, there are, if you, if you read through the rules, there are certain rules that have like certain members names and it's because they found a gray area or something like that where, Oh, Hey, I can, I can do this. Right. So I think one of the rules is you can have like a tablet in the car or a laptop if you're going to tune it, as long as you can easily remove it. Now, some people, what they'll do is their car will be within the budget for the autocross. And I guess I didn't talk about this. So there, yeah. Like what is the premise of, yeah. So you're, you're going to, in the daytime, uh, in the morning, you, you autocross the car, you get, uh, three passes that they, they have pro drivers at the event and you're allowed to just hand your keys to them and whatever time they get on your car and counts. they must drive some hoopties, those pro drivers. They good for good on them. They will, they will voice their opinions, both good and bad. I mean, they're, they're all pretty nice. Yeah. Um, but they're also very excited because they, they, they get to drive stuff they've never seen thrash on it. I mean, I'm sure, Oh yeah. I'm sure. They break pretty often. Yeah, this is a lot of stuff is pushed back to the pits. Yeah. Um, so you'll, you'll autocross your vehicle. Um, and whatever time a pro driver gets can be counted towards your time. And then in the evening you drag race it. And then, uh, now naturally there's no pro drivers for drag racing. So you're, you're on your own. You just got to floor it. Yeah, exactly. And then, uh, in the, the next day, it's a two day event, uh, in the morning, your car is judged in what's called a concourse. So there's a panel of judges that go around and judge each car based on, uh, engineering, ingenuity, creativity, and you have, uh, it's either two or three minutes to, to kind of present plead your, your case case there. And it's very difficult because some of these cars, for example, that Corvair that took three years to build, how are you going to fit all your time and effort? So you have to really pick and shoot. That is the most difficult part of the event to me. If your car survives yeah. presenting your vehicle and like, if you're, if you're really contending to like win the event, that is, that is the most difficult. You've got to have your spiel set up and ready. Exactly. <laughs> so jo- Georgia tech, uh, they're, uh, they they have a like a, a ASME group, uh, much like University of Florida has a formula group. UCF has a formula group. Georgia Tech has been coming to this event since its inception, and mm-hmm. other colleges will send their engineering groups there with a build that they've built collectively. And Georgia Tech typically does very well in the concourse because they have like they have a group of like twenty presenters, and they always have. It's very like similar. PowerPoint to, ready to go. Yeah, but it's very similar to lemons, right? So people mm-hmm. can get very creative. Uh, uh, my buddy, my buddy's had a uh, GSXR 600 swap Datsun Roadster. Mm-hmm. It was on like a quarter midget chassis, and they dressed as monks, and they uh, they they passed out these pamphlets like they were. Yeah, like, like they were trying to priest. get you to join their congregation. It was it was hilarious. Yeah, so uh, it, it's a it's a lot of fun. Um, there's a lot of unique vehicles, and what I like about the event is I've been to a lot of events like like you as well, like FL two K and stuff like this. You're, you're you're thrashing to to compete, but you want to you know you're there to do good for you you. Most of the time, right? People will help out other people in the event, mm-hmm. but like I've never truly seen an event where like even people that are contending to win are helping you get your car back to running Yeah, like a competitor that could directly take them out. Yeah. It's right? not as cutthroat as, exactly. as a drag racing event. And that's how sick week kind of is too. It's not mm-hmm. as cutthroat as most competitions because we all help each other out. Exactly. And it's very similar in that. I like that camaraderie, right? I mean, at the end of the day, you're all competing in the same sport that we're all trying to keep alive. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's pretty great to see. And the event, I mean, it's probably the most fun event that I attend on an annual basis. And it's local. It's in Gainesville. Which oh, I wow. Like. Yeah. I think the camaraderie comes from all going through the same pain. Yeah. And you know that guy went through the same pain as you to be where you are because he had two grand. He had he dealt with the same stuff. His car is breaking. Your car is breaking. Yep. The same with Sick Week. Like, we all have to do that same drive. Nobody gets out of it. When you go to, like, a, a big drag race, like, and there's 20 people working on one car, 
and there's two people, one person working on your car, you know that you're not in the same. Mm -hmm. It's not the same situation. Not yeah. that there's anything wrong with that. It's just it's not the same. It's the camaraderie is you're not all in this together in the same way as you are on sick week. Yeah, With absolutely. Two people working on one car. It's like, yeah, it's just a crucible. That's where it comes <laughs> from. Yeah. The, the powers in the group of pain, I guess you could yeah. say. Yeah. But so this event, uh, it, it's kind of changed over the years. I mean, um, so this is actually where I met my buddy Calvin, who I alluded to earlier. Um, and they've made some incredible stuff that he's honestly probably one of the most talented machinist engineers I, I know. Um, they started their 4200 venture there, um, putting it into a Futura. But, you know, speaking to the Crucible thing, right, like two or three years ago, I had a FC RX-7 that I brought there. I brought two years in a row. And the first year I brought it, I was like, man, I'm actually going to be prepared. I'm not going to procrastinate. Because typically what happens, and anyone that goes to the event can, can speak to this. But a FC RX-7, $2,000? I bought it for six hundred dollars as a roller. Uh, it it actually had a title. I still have a screenshot of the post. Um, he was asking. I think he was asking twelve hundred dollars. And I do the same thing I do with every single person. I tell them about the event. And typically, in my in my opinion, I mean, this is slightly selfish, but I'm like, if they're really a car guy. They're going to sympathize with <laughs> me. I mean, granted, sure. You really need the money. And if you, if you have something yeah. that's worth it, not everybody goes for it. I mean, he could have said no. Exactly. Yeah. That's but, his choice. Uh, I told him what I was doing and he was like, just shoot me an offer, man. And I was like, would you take 600 bucks? And he's like, yeah. I'm like, damn it. I should have offered him 400 bucks yep. <laughs> every time. But, uh, yeah, we had an RX-7. I I always loved that body style of RX-7. Um, it, to me, it looks like the like the third gen Supra, which I also think is underappreciated. Yep. Um, Those are great looking cars, both of them. I, I, I love FCs. I, I think they're great. I, I actually have the opportunity to buy it back and, and I might, and my wife might kill me because I have like 14 cars currently. <laughs> but um, I wanted to put an LS in it. So we, we put a 5.3 with a cam. Almost every vehicle I've ever built for grassroots, minus the first year that I went, has had a micro squirt as the, as the standalone. And for a lot of people that I don't know, right? Like it is possible to build a turbo LS for cheap or even a naturally aspirated, like, you know, cam nitrous LS and a, a micro squirt. For those that don't know, you could buy a brand new one for $400. Mm -hmm. Now you're going to be, you get what you pay for, right? So there's like it's virtually no input outputs, right? Yeah. But you can still run flex fuel. It still has launch control. It has a uh, nitrous control built in. Um, and used, you can buy them even cheaper. So I think I paid like 200 bucks for mine with an eight foot harness. Um, you wire it into all the factory connectors and um, we get the car all the way to being done. I bought a turbo 400 for 50 bucks from a swap meet. Came out of a 1974 like RV. So yeah. I had like a heavy duty Sprag. I had to change the tail housing. Now the weak link of the FCRX7, unless you get a turbo two is going to be the diff. So I knew that all right, I'm not going to be able to really launch this car, but it should still go pretty quick. Um, the night before the event, the motor blew up. And I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Well, at the time, I had a, uh, a 4.8 liter LS sitting in a Fox body in my garage. And it had a lot of nice parts on it. But I reached out to Tom Sutterd, who is uh, the event coordinator. He's also uh, one of... I don't know if he's one of the owners of Grassroots or if he just like operates it. It was a family owned business. But uh, I reached out to him and I said, hey, uh, there is like a hardship rule where you if, if you if you break something in testing or break something like in the event or close to the event, you can replace it with something as close to what you have exempt of the budget. Yeah, so that I said, would make sense because. I mean, in theory, it's the same budget. It just, it broke. Like exactly. You're, you're not spending more money on an upgraded part. You're just yep. kind of straight across trading. Yeah. So at, I think at 7.30 in the evening, I called my father-in-law, who was just at my house. He lives like two doors down. And he just heard the car running. And I was like, hey, I blew up the motor. And he thought I was messing with him because that's what I like to do. And I'm like, I am not kidding. So I was like, 
I got the approval. We can pull the motor out of the Fox body, pull the motor out of the RX-7. I swapped everything over that I could, except the Fox body had head studs. But most people know that you can factory head bolts on an LS can handle. Yeah enormous amounts of power like perfectly fine so i just i was like i'm not unbolting them i've already torqued them i'm just gonna leave them i swapped everything else and uh we got the car back together and running at like 3 30 in the morning and went to the event that like five hours later and actually did very well i think we finished fifth overall that year in that car that was the first car i've ever had that was a cover of a magazine (laughs) um but yeah that was uh that was uh, like my worst year post or I guess pre-event and during the event was the very next year. I took the nitrous kit off, put a turbo kit on it. I thought this is going to be great. I blew the car up like the first autocross pass with the turbo. And we uh, didn't, I will more than admit, I am not a tuner, right? Like I can get, I am, I know just enough to be dangerous. So I, I can get the car running and then as soon as it runs good enough, boom, auto tune. Set yep. set target AFR, set target ignition, everything, and let it do its thing. I will happily let the tuners do their job. Yeah. I avoid that as much as possible. But I guess when you're in a budget situation, you're kind of stuck unless yeah. you have a tuner that's gonna do it for nothing. And typically, like you know, I try to rope someone I know into my team that's good at tuning or someone, mm-hmm. you know, kind of enlist someone like, hey, like, can you help me? <laughs> Is so, every LS I've ever tuned, I have 100% sent a rod express mail to Jesus. Well, most LSs kind of do that. Yeah. They kind of LSs are very expirational. They have a they have a finite window when they'll live. Yeah. They all end up letting go. I don't know anybody that out there that's not blown up a couple or broken a few LSs cuz it's kind of just how they are. Yeah, I've heard that which makes me feel a little bit better, but it's still a little disheartening sometimes when you're like, ah, you know, maybe this is not my calling. <laughs> Sucks to have to pull it out again. That's oh, always a pain in the butt. hundred percent. You know, a couple hours of engine hoisting and undressing a motor. That's oh, never fun. But it, aside from that, they do blow up. You have some other performance cars though, don't you? I do. I have a, uh, so I'll start with what was most recently on that dude and blues channel, which was, uh, I have a gen two twin turbo Viper. Um, now, most people hear that statement and they're like, my God. I hear that and I'm like, is that thing just constantly trying to kill you? Yeah, but it's also not the power level of like what you see nowadays on like 1320 and that racing channel where these guys are driving four digit Calvo and Nth Moto. Not 2,800 horsepower? No, I'm, the, the car is on a stock motor and uh, this the second half of second gen Vipers were known to have what's called a cream puff motor. So they'd cast pistons, um, and they can't really handle that much power. So I'm, I'm only on six pounds. Um, it makes about 650 at the wheel. And to me, it's just a super fun street car. Like, I wanted a Viper since I was a kid. Like, I played Gran Turismo on PlayStation 1. Mm-hmm. I would always dress it out and, like, make it look like just an outrageous, like, track car. Um, so when I had the opportunity to buy this car, um, I, I bought it already turboed. Um, had some issues we've we've gone through a little bit. I actually just put a six point roll bar in it, so because I think the car is capable of running tens. It's gone low elevens at about one hundred and thirty, um, okay. but they're notoriously difficult to get out of the hole. Yeah. Um, as a roll car, like it's really fun. I might turn it. I think I can turn it up like one more pound, which is the famous last words, uh, and probably get you know what I need to to make it run tens, but. It's such a fun car to drive. Um, my drag car, which I'm hoping will be done for FL2K, fingers crossed, because I, I do already have my my ticket, uh, is I have a 93 Cobra that has like 14,000 original miles. has a 25.5 cage, still a stick shift H pattern car with a big turbo Gen 2 Coyote. So this is my okay. That's actual kind of a uh, car. That's that's kind of a cool deal. That the Coyote stuff is probably the coolest motor out right now to I, begin with. I really love that car. I mean, out of everything I had, I could go out to that car. You know, I I'm currently in the middle of building a shop, so I don't have a lot of space for all these projects. So it would stay in my trailer, and for 
months I wouldn't drive it because you know, my my mo my most recent job that I had I traveled across the country um, and I worked on these power plants that we talked about so I wouldn't be home for months at a time and I'd come home and then I'd start to go through all the cars and start them and almost every single one of them gave me an issue but I could go out to that that Cobra yep pull the connect switch start the car right up what do you see you as that car on so it was on a Ford Racing Control Pack um, when it was naturally aspirated. Then I added a Pro Charger. And then since we have removed the Pro Charger, added the turbo, and put in a Holly. So um, I haven't driven it yet since we've made a lot of these upgrades. It's still getting finished up. But uh, it's on a Holly Terminator X um, or Terminator X Max. Yeah. I think it's X Max. Yeah, X Max has the trans controls. Yeah, it doesn't have a trans yeah, controller. Yeah, so though. X just X doesn't need the trans. Okay, controller. so it may just be an X, and yeah. and I may go to a Dominator for more inputs and outputs. But mm -hmm. I also have a digital dash in it, so it gave me a little bit more. Um, yeah, you can pretty much do everything with a Terminator. It's mm -hmm. nice to have the uh, the different O2 sensors that you get with the Dominator. Yeah. I, now, to be honest, I haven't really had a lot of luck with Holly lately. Granted. The two Hollies I've had were used, but I've bricked both of those ECUs. And I don't know, on the Holly forum or a Holly page on Facebook, I've seen a lot of people doing the same thing. And I don't know if it's like, the first one was my fault. I have a Hemi swapped square body Dodge that has a Terminator X. And I did not know at the time when I first fired it up that the charging system was wrong. And mm -hmm. I... Sent way too much voltage to it and yeah. gone. Like, so I called Holly Tech Support, which is fantastic. Their customer service is great. Yeah, a lot and, of people answering the phones there. Yeah, and and they, you know, the guy walked me through step by step, like what should what should I do? And I'm like, it was classic scene from like The Office, where I'm like, talk to me like I'm five, and then he talked to me, and I'm like, talk to me like I'm two. <laughs> yeah, bring it down a little bit. <laughs> yeah. More. So yeah. he he really walked me through everything, and then kind of was like, well. uh, you're used to use trash, bud. Mm. And they didn't have any, like like most companies, right? A lot of their stuff's on back order. So I found a used one. And I don't know that this used one was ever fully good. You know. May have always been a, because uh, I had may a, have always been an issue. Somebody messed it up and then sold it. Yeah. And I had a, because I had, I fixed the charging issue. We put a one wire alternator. So it's just self exciting. Yeah. Um, and, but the voltage would always bounce around on the screen. It was really weird. And eventually it would stabilize like 13.9. I'm like, okay, that's what it's supposed to do all the time. And I'm like going through the harness, like checking, making sure everything is fine and couldn't find anything that was wrong. And, and, and fast forward is now, now the computer's dead, which is why I'm actually selling this project. Oh yeah. Selling the square body. I am. Yeah. Okay. Actually that potentially to a guy that is on team Gravedigger as a technician. Oh, that's cool. Which is super cool. And apparently I didn't know this until talking to him, but Gravedigger uses a Holly Dominator. That would make sense as well. The, uh, the Gen 3 <laughs> Hemi stuff has definitely come a long way. I think it's on the up and mm -hmm. up. I think it's on the rise because there's a lot more in the yeah. junkyards now, and that's kind of how it works. We have a trickle-down. It's kind of a trickle-down car, guys, where... As things trickle down into the junkyards, that's when car guys start to get into them. Yeah. And I, I put this Gen 3 Hemi in my square body Dodge thinking it was going to be so cool. I like I always wanted a short bed, regular cab burnout truck, like a shop truck. Yeah. So uh, actually... Ice cream getter, as Matt calls them. Yeah. Uh, and I wanted... Uh, so I bought an SN95 that someone swapped a Gen 3 Hemi in, ironically. And it mm -hmm. ran and drove. And I bought it for less than what I could find a drivetrain for because a gen three Hemi, even a five, seven and TR 60, 60 are not cheap. No. And I learned quickly. This is what I don't like about the gen three Hemi is everything is so expensive. Like a cam kit for an LS from BTR or Texas speed or anything, right. Is like what? 400, 500 bucks. You get a cam springs lifters. That same cam kit for a gen three Hemi is over a thousand dollars. For what reason? Yeah. Like you're not making more power than a Camd LS. And yeah, it's not really any different metal or parts. So, it, you know, I, I bought I bought it used. I think I still paid 800 bucks. But I, I got a Texas Speed Stage 4 Cam, Hellcat lifters, and dual springs for the head. And uh, I still paid like 800 bucks. I mean, it was new. 
uh, the guy was going to install it in his charger, and I guess his charger got stolen. But the 5764 share the same cam. His chargers always get stolen. Yeah. It's kind of that common car to get stolen. That's the, for the lack of better words, the low credit <laughs> score car. Yeah, that's kind of how it ends up being, unfortunately. BMW drivers and V6 charger owners are the worst drivers on the road. They always get stolen, and they end up uh, doing crazy shit in an intersection, that kind of whole deal. Oh, yeah. Let me take out a person and just keep doing donuts. Yeah, that's kind of <laughs> it. Well, man, we're, uh, we're getting to the end of this. We've got to wrap it up. Um, dude, thanks for coming on. Where can they find you at? Where can they see some of these projects? Yeah, I know you were so, talking about your YouTube. Uh, I have a YouTube channel. It's not very big, but, uh, you know, Jay Witt, uh, it's just kind of an abbreviation of my name. Um, that's my YouTube channel. Uh, I have Instagram J underscore Whitaker 54, typically where I post a lot of my car stuff and cool. That's about it. Well guys, go check them out. Um, that's going to do it though. Thanks for coming on, man. I appreciate it. We, I got to learn a, a ton about all that cool interesting stuff that I probably shouldn't know about, but (laughs) yeah, that'll do it guys. Thank you so much for watching. (laughs) We will see you next time.